Embarking on your first development with only a shoestring budget is far from ideal. If you thought you could move the bathroom upstairs and put a new kitchen in for £10,000, I think you're in cloud cuckoo land for that. <laughs> but tonight's two sets of developers are doing exactly that. I just went into the auction room with a hot head, a couple of grand in my pocket, and just raising my hands. up houses on a tiny budget and turning them over quickly is how a lot of developers start. It can be a great way to learn, but you need to make your money work for you. This week's sets of developers are both in their 20s and neither are letting a lack of money, age or experience stop them from having a go at developing. But their choice of location couldn't be more different. Habib Khan has a location to die for, right on the sought-after Brighton seafront. While Damon Marshall and Corin Ellison have opted for the outskirts of Kirkby, north of Nottingham. They believe this street is up and coming and ripe for developing. It's also the only place they could afford to buy. They paid £50,000 for this two-bed terrace in desperate need of renovation, and they've given themselves just ten weeks to transform it. It's Damon and Corin's first attempt at developing, and they simply can't afford not to make a profit, as they're both up to their eyeballs in debt. By both of us working full-time, we just thought it's going to take years to pay off. Uh, so we thought that if this can work out for us, it's a good way of paying off a lump sum, you know, reasonably quickly. Corin's a first-year nurse, and Damon's left university early because he thinks this project could kick-start a career in developing. But it's a massive gamble. Not only are their debts huge, but they've only been able to afford it by taking out a dangerous 100% mortgage. The time we paid the, the mortgage, the loan, um, credit card debt, we're left with about £150 a month. Between us. Between us. It's going to be really tough. And it's a perilous way to start a big project. I don't think they've the first idea what they're letting themselves in for. Oh, they smell it. Yeah, it smells of cats and dogs. We. We. Yes, <laughs> cats and dogs, we. Yes, that's, um, that's very ripe. So you put no deposit down and you've got 100% mortgage on it. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's quite a brave thing to do. And how are you going to finance doing the project? The, Refurbishment costs. We've uh, only just last week managed to uh, secure a loan for ten thousand. Um, so who are short for? We use credit cards to fund the rest. Gosh, right. So you've got credit cards ready and waiting. Well, we've got about ten at the moment. Uh, we've had to use for student life. So at worst comes to worst, we'd have to use those. So you've got ten credit cards. Yeah. yeah. They're not all maxed out. We have got some credit on some. It's yeah. kind of evenly distributed. So how much is the debt you've got before you bought this house? Including student loan debt, overdraft debt and credit card, we've got nearly 50,000 between us. 50,000? 50,000, yeah. So you had a 50,000 pound debt, <clears throat> so you decided to buy a house for 50,000 pounds? Yeah. To make it 100,000 pounds debt? Plus the loan we've just got for 10,000 as well. To make it 110,000 pounds yep. debt? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Property developing is always a risk, but by leaving themselves so vulnerable financially, Damon and Corin have absolutely no room for manoeuvre. They really are going to have to stick religiously to their already minuscule budget. They bought the house for £50,000, and they've borrowed a further £10,000 to pay for the renovation. They hope to sell for £70,000 which would make them a gross profit of £10,000. It's a pretty tight budget. I mean, who's going to be doing the work? Hoping to do 90% um, of ourselves, aren't we? Um, but I've just done a two-week course, um, done a plumbing course, and also done a plastering course there. Gosh, all in two weeks? Yeah. <laughs> hey! <laughs> so you now can plaster and plumb? Uh, I've learned the basics, yeah. I mean, I admire your guts to go into this, but it is quite a tall order, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let's have a look at what your plans are then. The layout of this house is typical of two up, two downs in the area. Upstairs, there's a makeshift loft conversion used only for storage. 
and on the first floor, two good-sized double bedrooms. Downstairs, there's two reception rooms, and at the back, a shabby extension which houses a narrow galley kitchen and the only bathroom. In property terms, a £10,000 budget will generally not go very far at all, but Damon hopes otherwise. Basically, at the moment, the bathroom being downstairs, we sort of considered moving that upstairs and then opening the whole sort of um, kitchen area out and then putting sort of some French doors at the bottom. Um, but basically, just to create some wow factor. Most of the houses in this area don't have an upstairs bathroom. And if I was you, I'd leave the bathroom where it is. I understand your sentiment completely. Our sort of thoughts was by doing that, we're not necessarily going to add value to it, but we're going to make it a unique one off. But if you thought you could move the bathroom upstairs, and knock through all of this and put a new kitchen in for £10,000. I think you're in cloud cuckoo land for that. <laughs> in the right location, moving a bathroom to extend the kitchen can earn money. But here it will cost more than it adds. To fit it in, they'd need to halve the second bedroom, which would make it little more than a box room. And they want to reverse the stairs, costing even more money they just don't have. What you need to do with this house is clean it and redecorate it and sort out the clear problems, which are the damp, which, are, which is the central heating. I am quite worried about the fact you've got 10 credit cards, you're up to your eyeballs in debt. You can't get your hands on any more money. This is as much as you can possibly muster. And if this development ends up costing more than £10,000, you're in real trouble. It's essential to know when to invest money and when to rein it in. The market for this house is likely to be first-time buyers, so the key is keeping the asking price down, and that means keeping costs as low as possible. In Brighton, there's a much higher chance of achieving a premium. Property here is notoriously expensive. But 27-year-old NHS trust worker Habib Khan thinks he's found a real bargain. A tired three-bed apartment right on the seafront. It is a great location, but the building itself has been seriously neglected since the 1960s. However, it is now undergoing a £4.5 million restoration to its exterior and communal areas. With the right finish and in such a great spot, Habib's flat could be a real gold mine. I am very confident. I am actually got a smile on my face every night I go to sleep. Habib borrowed money from his mother and bought the apartment at auction for £123,000. He has a small budget of just £15,000 and optimistically hopes that after renovation, he can sell the flat for a substantial £320,000. This would net him a massive gross profit of £197,000, an unbelievable 143% return. At least it could, if he hadn't overlooked one very large problem. Very bad news. I have to pay £75,000 towards the refurbishment cost of the uh, flat MC Court. Um, so £75,000? £75,000. That's including radiator, double glazing, painting it. A list of stuff. And you bought it in auction? Yeah. Was it not in the paperwork? How, how did this happen? Well, the paperwork wasn't up to scratch in a sense. There was too much reading materials there, and I didn't really read the paperwork. I just went into the auction room with a hot head, a couple of grand in my pocket, and just raising my hands. Just went a bit crazy. Uh, but how are you going to find that money? Well, I've spoken to my mother, and uh, she's willing to remortgage her property. How does your mother feel? She's shocked, but we had discussion and everything, and she's, you know, she, she really has trust in me and faith in me. I hope your mother's right. You're gambling with her home and with her future on this, so there's a lot at risk. Not reading the sales documents means Habib's already blown five times his initial budget. He's unbelievably lucky his mother has bailed him out and that the margins on this project are so big. He still hopes to net a profit of £122,000. But that's only if he can achieve his enormous sale price and stay on budget. Both of which are very big ifs.
Damon Marshall and Corin Ellison are starting to strip out their two-bed terrace in Kirkby outside Nottingham. They're gambling on making a £10,000 profit to help lift them out of a mountain of debt. But their very first job proves rather unpleasant. Oh. <laughs> on the carpet for 10 years. Oh, that's disgusting. They're hoping that the smell will disappear along with the carpets, but it seeped through the floorboards and permeated the fabric of the whole house. It is a bit depressing because you've done everything that you can to get rid of it. We've got air fresheners in every room. We've cleared as much junk out as we can. We're bleaching constantly and it's still, still here. A week's elbow grease and six bottles of bleach later, and they feel they've done all they can. Oh, it's still a bit smelly in here, isn't it? It's is a bit still. Yeah. It's been bleached no, five, six times. Really? Yeah, and dosed lot. down there. And what are your plans next? <laughs> Maybe just varnish the floor to seal the smell in. Mm. Mm, that sounds nice. Mm. I'm not convinced you should be sealing the smell in. I think you should be taking the smell out. There are two options you have. There are products that neutralise the urine. I think you should think about trying one of those products. If that doesn't work, you have no alternative but to take the floorboards out and put chipboard in, regardless of how much it costs, because you're going to end up with a house that's nearly modernised that stinks of pee. We did consider. For viewings, if you had you air fresheners in, it. you wouldn't notice it. Do you, do you follow my kind of...? Yeah, you see, you're thinking you squirt a lot of air freshener before people look round. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think that you'll get away with that. You'll always get caught with um, trying to cover up problems. If you don't put it right at this stage, it will come back to haunt you, and you could end up with a house that you can't sell. They have to get rid of that smell, even if it means laying new floors. It's another blow on top of discovering the bowed ceilings also need replacing. But despite their growing workload and a 10-week deadline, they're keen to make unnecessary, expensive changes to the layout. They still want to move the bathroom upstairs, so call some builders in for a quote. If, if you're going to move this room, what are you going to do in here if you don't go back? I have a knock straight through to do what? Extend the kitchen and patio doors at the bottom. Well, if you're just selling it off, you've got a good sized kitchen anyway, really. Yeah. Damon can only afford a thousand pounds to move the bathroom upstairs. Off the door there into the bathroom, if it's to move the stairs back six foot and have a room uh, door into a box bedroom there. Two grand. What to move the bathroom up here? Yeah. And do all that. <laughs> More like three grand. Okay. That's three times more than his budget will allow. Talking a lot of money for small rooms. No one's going to want to buy, buy a house with small rooms. <clears throat> he only has a meagre three thousand pounds for all the building materials and labour, including plastering. Just two thousand pounds for replumbing the entire house and installing central heating. Seven hundred and fifty pounds for urgent damp proofing. £1,250 for a new kitchen, £500 for the bathroom, just £1,500 for all the decorating and flooring, and £1,000 to sort out the garden. And there's not a single line in his budget for contingency, borrowing costs or any fees. On this budget, there's just no room for costly layout changes. Initial thought, £10 is a lot of money to spend, but, you know, I think you soon realise that it's not, and it... It's eating up very quickly. Of course, the golden rule of shoestring developing is to keep major work to a minimum and add value in the kitchen and bathroom. To bag the best bargains, shop at the end of the season when stores want to bring in new ranges. The high street slump means many retailers are offering huge discounts of up to 70%. And there's also a new breed of warehouse springing up. They're buying up the oversupply and customer returns from the mainstream companies, so you can get expensive designer fittings at knockdown prices. 
If you shop cleverly and keep your plan simple, you can get a great look on a small budget. For Damon and Corinne, the reality of what they'd hoped to achieve on just £10,000 is finally sinking in. All this sort of grand design ideas we had to we've scrapped. Uh, it, it does look now, looking back, a silly idea. Um, not only for what it would cost, but I don't think it's actually warranting a property like this. And, you know, I agree with what everyone said, builders and Sarah, that you're not going to add value by doing that. Um, so, you know, learn as we go, basically. Damon and Corinne have made a wise decision to work with what they've got. In Brighton, Habib Khan should also be re-evaluating his over-ambitious plans to modernise his 1930s flat. The unexpected £75,000 bill for refurbishing the building has totally blown his original £15,000 budget. Yet he still wants to completely gut the place. What I'm going to do here is put, fit in cupboards inside the space, give it a bit more modern, contemporary look. Literally everything has to go. I'm going to take the whole cupboard out. It's just taking out space for no reason. And to put a new contemporary door in, well, these doors are very old. And also put halogen lights, spotlights all the way around to give the atmosphere of the most contemporary look. But Habib's plans overlook one crucial thing. This building is grade two star listed, yet Habib not only wants to rip out all the original 1930s fittings, he's also planning unnecessary and potentially illegal structural changes. His apartment has two good-sized bedrooms, a big T-shaped lounge and two small balconies with sea views in the front. And at the back, a kitchen, single bedroom and bathroom. Habib wants to replace the original bedroom doors off the lounge with angled stud walls with interior windows. But being able to see into the bedroom from the sitting room certainly won't give any more privacy. And there's an even bigger problem. Although Habib knows the building is listed, he hasn't read his paperwork again. So he hasn't got a clue what listing actually means. I oh, hope that was an original. In fact, any alterations need listed building approval. But Habib is only now inviting the conservation officer around, believing she'll just rubber stamp his plans. This is just a waste of space, just taking it all out and uh, just making one cupboard unit here, uh, just make it more user-friendly for the ladies. No, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to be negative with you. I think that this should remain. I think it's actually very good storage anyway. It's even nice furniture. It's, it's lovely. I'm sure that this was the original airing cupboard, which means that I'm reluctant to see that go. I would suggest that you'd be mad to, uh, to take them out. One by one, Habib's plans are going up in smoke. He mustn't touch any original fittings, not the airing cupboard, not the door handles, and not the light switches. And as for the angled false walls... I wouldn't want to see those doors lost or the, um, or the alignment of that, that wall, I'm afraid. So, basically, I have to keep the door and the shape. Yeah. I didn't know any of this stuff. It just hit me like the 75,000, it hit me again. Uh, back to the drawing boards. Habib has no choice but to opt for a straight refurbishment. But what he thinks is a disaster could be the very thing that sells his flat. Brighton is a stylish, trendy city where buyers will pay for good design and 1930s architecture is rare and now highly fashionable. Habib is likely to find a buyer prepared to pay a premium if he restores his flat sympathetically. Getting the old items that's here look new, making it work with my contemporary look, that's going to be the difficult challenge. Habib needs a crash course in 1930s style, so I'm taking him to an example of an authentically restored flat. Now, I love this bathroom because they've taken inspiration from the original architecture 
and made it contemporary and really fun. Look at everything from the pull switch, the towel rail and the flooring. In this flat, all the original detailing has been used and left, like the door handles, like the architrave, like the door handle over here, like the original fireplace. And I'm not suggesting that you make it into a museum, but just take inspiration from the era it was built. I was actually looking at a kitchen which had um, the Victorian cupboard and chrome and stuff like that, but I looked at the modern one, they're more cheaper than the old style looking. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you want to go down too much the Victorian yeah. route, because 1930s architecture's quite simple lines, mm. clean, smooth lines. The other issue is that you've only got £15,000 mm. that you can spend on the flat. Now, I, that's a fantastically unrealistic budget, I think. You, you need to concentrate on spending money where you've got to, like a new bathroom and a new kitchen. And what you mustn't do is put the wrong kitchen yeah. in, in that space. I really do like the simplicity in here, so it kind of gives me a vision of what I could do now. Habib has got to get the 1930s look absolutely right. If he can pull it off, he could reap big rewards and claw back some of that extra £75,000 cost. In Kirkby, near Nottingham, Damon and Corinne have such massive debts that they can't afford for anything to go wrong. But Corinne's had to go back to work, and left to his own devices, Damon is falling behind on his 10-week schedule. Four weeks in, and all he's managed to do is prepare the walls for damp proofing and board out two rooms. It's a bit depressing, because you come in every day, and after a full day, I've been doing 12-hour days for the last two and a half weeks, I've had one day off. And you're not really seeing any major changes at the moment. Damon's not been idle, just disorganised. He's starting more and more jobs, and he never gets around to finishing any of them. Uh, I at least started going around the house, uh, writing down in my little book um, all the jobs I actually needed doing. But I think I got through about two or three rooms, and I thought, sod this. <laughs> Giving up on a proper schedule is the last thing they ought to be doing. They're now five weeks into a ten-week development, and even though they've moved into the house to keep their costs down, the longer it takes, the less profit they'll make. Do you have a schedule of works at all? No? I've got a priority of work. Um, OK. Um, basic... <laughs> that's basic... it? That's it, yeah. Cool. Well, that's clear. There's only five <laughs> things to do, so you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> One a day, five days. <laughs> oh, no, the sixth thing is a holiday. Yep. So on the sixth day, he rested. <laughs> Damon needs a proper schedule of works or he'll lose all control of this development. I mean, clearly the flashing here is shot and this plaster is going to have to be hacked off. Are you going to do that or is someone else going to do that, do you think? It's something I, I believe I could do myself. So are you going to be doing the joinery? I'm afraid so, yeah. Ooh. Um, are you going to be fitting the kitchen? Yep, so it will be. Okay. Are you going to be doing the tiling? Yep. Um, who's going to be fitting the bathroom? Me again. You again? <laughs> OK. Not even a professional could get through a to-do list like this. These two just must bring in some extra help. If you're planning on doing everything yourself, there's absolutely no chance you're going to get this finished in five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and if I was you, I would get a plaster in because bad skimming looks so awful. I'd also get a plumber in because you won't have any problems with le weeping pipes. Would you recommend trying the plaster at least? And then if it uh, didn't work, PVA gluing it and then getting someone else in to, to come over that? If it's going to take you three weeks to do what will take someone else a day and cost £150, it just doesn't stack up. And to get the maximum sale price for this house, you've got to have a good finish. You cannot have a good finish with bad plaster work. They ought to be doing all they can to speed up, but no sooner am I out of the door than Damon's taking on all the plastering himself. I think it's from the outset I said I was going to give it a try and I'm going to stick to my word, really, at least. Yeah, give it a go, definitely. Prove my doubters wrong. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 
Three weeks later, he's still at it, and it's showing no sign of ever being finished. <laughs> Run out of plaster halfway through a wall, which isn't good. In just two weeks, he should be putting this house on the market, but there's no sign of a kitchen or a bathroom. The plumbing's still shot, and the loo is a bucket in the backyard. Damon Marshall and Corin Ellison are hoping to clear some of their student debts by making a £10,000 profit renovating this two-bed terrace in Kirkby near Nottingham. But Damon's money-saving idea to do all the work himself means they're five weeks behind schedule. Exhausted and fed up, they're starting to realise that perhaps they should have managed things differently. If we'd actually had someone into the plastering, the second it were done, we could actually realistically be on to like painting, fitting kitchens, fitting the bathroom by now. Um, no, I'm not a builder, I'm not, you know, I'm not done half this before. I'm just trying to learn. And... You can't just sit and relax, come away and watch telly, we're like, we need to do this, we need to do that. But I don't think we knew how stressful it would be. A month after they should have made the call, they finally accepted they need help. Employing a team of builders means that at last they can get the flashing fixed on the roof and get on with plastering the entire house. The money they saved not moving the bathroom upstairs has been much more usefully reallocated here. And for the first time in a long while, Damon's looking positive. It's just nice to see some change in the place. Um, been working on my own all the time. It's, um, it's nice to see someone else doing something. The builders finally get things moving on this development. But just when things are looking up, they've uncovered a possible disaster waiting to happen. There's nothing there at all. It's just like three bits of firewood holding the floor above. Isn't it? It should be above all window and everything. It's not even sitting on anything. There's no support there at all. Uh -huh. yeah. It looks like fence panels. There are missing lintel supports above all the aluminium windows, and the whole front wall is being held up by two flimsy pieces of wood. Nothing to support this wall at all here, so it's, it's just collapsed. Upstairs, the extent of the damage is alarming, and the wall around the windows is beginning to cave in. You can literally get your hand inside the wall. Well, that, it's, not, it's not very good at all, I mean. That wall's just totally collapsed. This could be serious and needs to be put right immediately. Unexpected dramas do nothing to help Damon's stress levels, but it wouldn't be such a surprise if he just had the right survey. We had a home buyer's report um, that cost you know, £300, um, which I know wasn't full structural, but you can have done, but I was touching five, six hundred, which I didn't think it was worth it. It might have cost him more initially, but a full-blown survey would have picked up the Boeing above the windows. The builders set about fitting proper lintels, but it means more delay, more money and more stress. In Brighton, work's well underway on Habib Khan's seafront apartment. He's finally accepted that it is the detailing that will sell this flat. But instead of making the most of the 1930s design, he's got his own ideas. It's going to have laminate flooring, magnolia wall painted, some old-fashioned round bulb lights. And it doesn't stop there. To make the most of his small dark kitchen, Habib should be going for something like this. A light, bright kitchen with clean, simple lines to complement the original design of his flat. But he's chosen to buy a wood effect country style kitchen. There's a couple of reasons why I think that this isn't the ideal kitchen for your development. One of them is that 
this isn't fashionable for today or 1930s, so it kind of misses both. And also, I think in a very small space, which your kitchen is a very small space, I don't think this is going to help it feel any bigger. But uh, this, as you can see, it looks very old-fashioned. It's not contem it's, it's not too contemporary and it's not too old. I, mean, I think for your kitchen, this would be much more appropriate. But this new range of, of white units has come out, which A, is white and reflective, so it's really good for sort of small spaces, and also the detailing of 1930s flat. It would have been this sort of detailing. Hmm. What do you reckon? Well, what about if I've got something plain, Yeah. but in that kind of wooden colour? You know, I've got this thing about... Do you not like white? It's too... It's like going to a doctor's for me. The other great thing about high-gloss units is that a cheap fridge or washing machine matches in with the, un the white units. So, actually, it's a really good budget way of, of having a kitchen and happens to be fashionable. As long as it gets the job done, I'm happy to consider it. And um, okay. I'm going to have to quickly go and run to my... Um, builders and make sure that they haven't bought the items yet. And then you're happy to go with it? I'm happy to go with it. Cool. Brilliant. Just, uh, if I don't sell, then I have to come back to you. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> In Kirkby, Damon's development is now six weeks over schedule. But despite having masses left to do, he's already thinking ahead to his next project. This is a classic dilemma faced by every serious developer. Leave it too long and you risk having weeks of no work. But look too soon and you risk losing focus on your current project. What's the next plan? We're basically looking for something where we can make, you know, more profit margin in there, take on something probably a little bit bigger, which, considering his financial situation, isn't the easiest, but uh, I think that's where the money is to be made, probably. Yeah, I mean, the, the greater the risk, the bigger the profit, but obviously that's the, the gamble, is you have to take a greater risk. Damon's found two derelict old shops with planning permission to turn into two one-bedroom flats. But I think there'd be a major undertaking with his massive debts. I think this is site value. There's not really much here that, <coughs> that can be used. And it would be cheaper to knock it down and start again. What, well, how much is it? Both two shops on the market at 50,000 uh, for both. And, and what does your research show that you'd get for, for those? Um, speaking to local agents, it's all about 40, 45k. Um, so 90. Yeah. I'd be amazed if there was any profit in it mm. because you're likely to spend at least 50, 60 building it. Yeah. The difficulty we're having is um, basically the money we've got available to spend, it's really hard to find somewhere with a profit margin involved in it. Yeah, I can understand that, and it's not easy finding deals, but with your second development, you have to make sure that you make a proper profit out of it, or it's not worth making the investment. The site is clearly overpriced. Damon needs a reality check. With no job, no income, and a mountain of debt, he's in no position to take on this level of risk. I have to say my heartfelt advice to you at this stage is that I think that you'd be better off getting a job and not doing this full time because you've just left university. I think you'd be better off working in the property industry for a few years and if you want to develop, I think you should be doing this on the side so that you don't actually have to use that money that you make in profit to live off. I, mean, I think what Sarah said about, you know, about going to work full time, saving up some money, Maybe it's probably the best thing, maybe, but it's not me. I'm too wanting to do my own thing, and, you know, I kind of... I don't think I'd be satisfied working full-time for someone else. It's, there's always kind of something there itching away at me. It's an admirable long-term aim, but at eight weeks over schedule, what he needs to do now is finish. In Brighton, Habib's decision to get builders in to do all the work means that after four months, his flat is finally finished. What was once a tired, run-down interior has been transformed into a light, bright and airy space. Although not slavishly 1930s in style, most of his changes don't fight with the original design.
Ah, so you went for the white kitchen in the end. That's it. So you're glad you didn't go to the wooden kitchen? I'm very glad I didn't go for the wooden kitchen. I would have made a big mistake. And are you pleased with it? I'm very, very pleased with this. It's different to what I've imagined and it actually goes much better. Oh, I'm good. very pleased. Being made to retain the original features has done Habib a huge favour, and he's even added some that are in keeping. But in the bathroom, his research has let him down. These are much more Victorian than anything to do with the modernist mm. movement. I tried to get as much closest to 1930s, but 1950s was the closest I could find. Victorian is 1950s, isn't it? No, 1960s, Victorian. No, it was 1850. Is it? Got my years mixed up then. <laughs> but no, I... 100 years between friends. Despite the occasional clash of styles, Habib has finished the flat to a high standard, but the whole thing has come in way over budget. He paid £123,000 for the flat and budgeted spending only £15,000, which from the start was totally unrealistic. How much did you end up spending in total? 230,000. Gosh, so, so to go from an expected spend of about 138,000 to 230,000 is a, a big old lump, isn't it? It is a big lump, but that I would blame because I didn't really, really read the print in the auctions. Mm. How much do you, do you think that it will be worth now? Well, I still hope it's worth 325 From day one, I think Habib's been very optimistic with his sale price. But now that the exterior building renovation is close to completion, it will be interesting to see what the agents think. When you look at things like the door handles, it's really nice that they try and keep everything in style with the original. And the fitted kitchen? All very in keeping with the period of the style of property. Nice to see that they've kept some of the original features. That's what people are looking for nowadays. You've still got the sea views from actually your bedroom, so you can be lying in your bed and still looking out to sea. And what a view, look at that. Balcony, splendid aspect. I'd value the property at £300,000. At the moment, I value the property round about the 300000 mark. I would value this property somewhere in the region of 260000 so the medium ground of those would be about 280. How, how do you feel about that? Well, I'm quite shocked, actually, in a sense. Uh, I was expecting that less. Um, I was more expecting at least 310,000 uh, because of the location. So you're kind of disappointed in that? Well, very disappointed. Right. I mean, if, if you did sell it for 280000 you would walk away with a £50,000 profit, which is, I think it's pretty good, actually, for a flat like this. It's over a 20% return on your investment. And you were originally hoping, on your original figures, to make a £187,000 profit on a flat which cost you £123,000. Well, it is bright, isn't there? Anything well, possible. I mean, I, I admire your optimism. Yeah. <laughs> so... I have to say, I think that the way you went into this project and the amount of research you did before you bought it, getting out with a profit at all is really lucky. <laughs> and, um, and, and I think if you can walk out with £50,000 in your back pocket, then you've done really well. Yeah, I know. But I think if I didn't have the refurbishment work to be added on to it, I would have walked out with what I was expecting to. Yeah, but you'd have never bought it at the price that you got it for. That's the problem. Despite a catalogue of errors, Habib's actually made a good profit. But overestimating your sale price can only ever lead to disappointment. In Kirkby, Damon and Corin are doing all they possibly can to get the best sale price. And their two-bed terrace is finally taking shape. The bathroom's come on loads, the garden's come on loads. It does feel like things are starting to come together now, which they haven't done before. And they've made progress on the smell front too. The suggestion to try a neutralising spray has worked, so the carpets can finally be laid. Wow. wow. <sighs> Waiting a long time for that. 
After months of hard work, they'll soon find out if their big gamble has paid off. Damon Marshall and Corinne Ellison gave themselves just £10,000 and 10 weeks to modernise their terraced house in Kirkby. It's actually taken 21 long and painful weeks, but they've finally done it. This is fantastic. And no smell. It's lovely. It smells of just lilies. <laughs> and what a great finish you've got. We spent hours at some point. <laughs> I think it's a really good thing you got the professionals in. Yeah. I hate to doubt you, but I don't think you could have got the walls as good as this. <laughs> Maybe not just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Despite their tiny budget, this development doesn't look cheap. It's simple yet stylish, and they've spent their money wisely. The money they saved by leaving the bathroom downstairs means as well as the finish, they haven't compromised the size of the second bedroom. This will have greater appeal for their particular market and make it far easier to sell. Are you glad that you didn't end up putting a bathroom upstairs, or have you ever thought you <clears> might <throat> wish you had? No, no, I mean, I think we're glad that we left as it was. I think having really good-sized double bedrooms in this area is going to command more of a premium than putting the bathroom upstairs. The existing bathroom has had a complete refit and looks great. As does the new kitchen, bought on sale for just £500. It's a good example of how, if you shop cleverly, having a small budget doesn't mean compromising on quality. So, how much did you end up spending? We spent nine and a half thousand on the actual building works in the place, and then there's about two thousand pounds worth of buying and selling fees, so it comes in at about eleven and a half. And you initially hoped to do it for ten thousand pounds, but to do it for ten or eleven and a half is seriously impressive. You must have worked your guts out to achieve that. Um, it's just been an obsession, hasn't it? Saving money. It certainly has been an obsession and they cut back on virtually everything. Building work and materials went down from £3,000 to £2,800. Damp proofing from £750 to £600. They replumbed the entire house on a budget of just £2,000. Fitted a brand new kitchen with appliances for £50 under budget at £1,200. The new bathroom costs slightly more than expected at £600, while decorating and flooring went from £1,500 to £1,400. And they've managed to shave a bit off the garden budget as well at £900. Unfortunately, they didn't include any fees in their original budget, which came in at £2,000, taking their total spend to £11,500, which is a phenomenal result. Five months of... Watching every single penny. Yeah. Really? So you yeah. ha have you been out much in the last I've five months? Not been out. Still. Not at all. <laughs> you haven't been out at all no. in five months. No, no. how? But we the last two weeks have been. <laughs> last two weeks have been hell. We've been absolutely. It's been nightmare. sixteen hour days. Wow, that's <laughs> really that's seriously impressive as a commitment. And obviously, the big hurdle is now actually selling it. They're hoping for a sale price of £70,000, but only one house on this street has ever sold for that, so it's touch and go whether they've done enough to convince the agents. Wow, what a really nice bright room. And it looks to be finished off really well as well. It's another good-sized room for a second bedroom. It still allows you to have a double room. What's nice about this bathroom, obviously, it's been refitted with a nice, nice white three-piece suite, nicely tiled, and it's a decent size. I would value this property at £70,000. I would value this house at £70,000. I value this property at £72,000. We have had three agents round to value the house, and the good news is that two of them came in at 70,000 and one came in at 72,000. So it's very impressive because it's well and truly broken through the ceiling price on the road. 
That's really good. That's good. Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> the average of those is £70,700, and if you did sell for that, you'd make a £9,200 profit, which is a <laughs> nice lump of money. But it's taken 21 weeks of hard work to do that. Was it worth it? Absolutely. We have, it. We have enjoyed yeah. it, yeah. Personally, for me, that amount of money is, you know, for being a student, it's a lot of money to us, and it's been worth every moment, hasn't it? All the time yeah. it's put into it, it's worth it. Well, I mean, hopefully, fingers crossed, that buyer will come rolling through the door. Colour scheme's really nice. You can do whatever you wanted to it, really, couldn't you? Downstairs bathroom. Didn't expect that. No. It's ideal having a toilet downstairs because if you're out gardening, yeah. you ain't got to traipse all the way up the stairs no. to uh, use the loo. Really good sized bedroom. Oh, it's another big bedroom. It, it feels like a new build. I really need to get my partner to come and have a look with me, but I am definitely interested in putting an offer on in this house. One of the reasons you took on this project was to try and pay off your debts. Are you going to be able to pay off your debts from it? Potentially we could, couldn't we? But I think we've decided that um, what we do make out of it, we're going to um, plough into the next project. So you're not going to pay off any debts from this one? Not this we're not, no. It's the only way forward, though. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, you really feel like you're in a trap, aren't we? And it's, I think you've got to take that risk, calculated risk, to actually achieve anything. So it's just encouraged you to gamble. <laughs> That's all it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Damon and Corin have certainly caught the property bug and can't wait to start their next development. Two months later, they've accepted an offer of £71,000, the highest price ever achieved on the street. In Brighton, Habib's not happy with a £50,000 gross profit and has decided to rent out his flat until it increases in value. Developing on a low budget is all about making the most of every penny. It's hard work, but if you buy carefully in the right location and stick to a realistic budget, you can still make it pay. Next week, the day job gets the push as two new developers think their fortunes lie in property. My tactic for staying in budget is to make it up as I go along. <laughs> One thing they don't look is classic or Roman. <laughs>